You're not looking up my nose. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? Good. How you doing? Good. Good. I didn't. You got the memo, the red memo. I see. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll keep it pretty brief. Just wanted to kind of end the series that I'm doing this week on trying to help guide people through navigating this weird time we're going through right now. Um, I've been interviewing some business people, but I thought there's a lot of people out there, especially younger athletes, that maybe they don't know what to do to stay sharp. You know, maybe their season's ended, stuff like that. So we'll go through some of that. I won't keep you too long. And uh, maybe we'll throw some cool stuff in there as well. Ah, cool. um, first of all, thank you for your time. No worries. Um, so just for everybody, in case they don't know, 16 season MLB vet, World Series champion, Dub Smash Hall of Famer. True. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of Dub Smash, since that's not really a thing, are we going to see a TikTok? I don't know. My daughter is on TikTok. I know they make some videos. Uh, that's not really my thing. I think that's definitely <laughs> younger uh, sure, generation. Sure. You know? sure, sure. Yeah, that's all right. It is, it is definitely more for the younger thing. How are you guys holding up over there? We're doing okay. I mean, we're, yeah. we're in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, so uh, we're able to kind of spread out a little bit. Sure. Uh, and we're still able to go outside. I think being outside is very important. You get a, as much sun as possible. Uh, obviously, you know, get uh, make sure you keep social distancing. Right. But I think, you know, we were made to be outside uh, as humans. And I think the sun is very beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. Gives you vitamin D. And I, and I know vitamin D has been, uh, that's helped fight various uh, diseases and stuff like that. So you can never go wrong if there's, you never can go wrong if there's sun out there. Try to get some sun. Try to, yeah, try to soak it up. Now, is there a lot of MLB The Show going on at the house? or? My son plays it all the time, and I refuse to play it until he makes a, a caricature <laughs> of me. Uh, I'm so upset that I'm not uh, in Legends mode. And the King Griffey Jr. is in it, Barry Bar. All those guys are, are in those Legends yeah. modes. I am not in there, but he says he's going to create uh, my character. So once he does that, I'll, I'll do some MLB The Show. That's, that's fair. So you might have to, maybe you sneak in there and do it when he's not around or something might have to do that do yourself um so with this unprecedented time off um how do how do the athletes stay busy or stay fresh um well it's, uh, that's a great question because this is unprecedented times it, it's yeah. not like you know where it's an off season where guys can get together uh -huh. and and work out together at the gym or, or go to a special uh a place like an athlete's performance or an exos that they have here in scottsdale uh, you have to be able to do things and be creative on your own. Sure. Uh, you may have to go to the park, go to the uh, local park to get your throwing in, get your hitting in, uh, maybe do some workouts at home. Uh, so you got to be very, very creative. And it's one of those things for baseball players. Uh, there's nothing like timing, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's timing up a pitcher, timing up, um, you know, if you're, if, if you're uh, a pitcher working on their mechanics, there's nothing like real time practice, meaning spring training, uh, facing uh, live batters or live pitchers. So you try to simulate that the best you can. So when you get to that point where, you know, Major League Baseball says, hey, we're able to come back to spring training, uh, you hit the, hit the ground running. So you're not kind of behind. So guys have to be very creative and find new ways to stay in shape. And I'm, I'm assuming the same goes for the younger athletes out there. He's maybe in high school bar, little league, uh, travel ball, um, just to stay active, stay outside. Now, do you have a, a specific drill that you that you like that you would maybe recommend for the younger athlete? Well, I, I think, um, you know, so let's say if you're a young athlete, and it really helps major leaguers too. I'm a big component of the hands, you know, especially in baseball, mm -hmm. you need your hands. Uh, and I love the wall drill. You can do it up against the fireplace in your home. You take a tennis ball, don't, you know, damage your <laughs> your parents house um but you can use a tennis ball or a racquetball you can you can throw it up against the steps uh your your fireplace a solid wall don't be throwing it up against a, a wall that makes marks um you can do it up against your garage if 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 you if you have one uh or just a hard surface it could be concrete where you can really work on your hands and i think that is the most important thing you do that uh repetitively um I know some pitchers are doing that, whether they take a, a, a hard ball to a hard surface and they work on their mechanics and while trying to throw at certain spots. So you can be creative. 
uh, as far as hitting, maybe get a net. If you don't have, you know, if you don't have a whole lot of space, get a tee. Uh, get some baseballs. Make sure your swing is is consistent, and work work on on that part of your game. So you still can do things to better better your your game um, by yourself. And, sure. and and it's one of those things where you can't probably hit live facing uh, a live pitcher, but you can do things to kind of benefit game. Those are the couple drills that that I would do. Okay. Um, not to cause any stir anything up, but thoughts on participation trophies. Oh man, uh, I, I don't like them. You know, I'm yeah. old school. You know, it, yeah. it, I really believe, and it's our fault. It, it really is. It's sure. not the kid's fault. It's our fault as parents. Um, you know, you have guys now. You're starting to see that they are entitled, and they feel like they're owed something. The problem is is sometimes we have babied our kids, we babied our our, our our young, thinking that you're all winners. You can't win on everything. You have to learn how to fail. You have to learn how to lose because that's the biggest component for success. I really believe that because if you're constantly uh, having success, you're constantly winning, so to speak, you get that sixth place trophy. When you get out to the real world, whether it's in athletics or whether it's in business, you're not able to take on or able to handle failure because guess what? You're going to fail in life. That's just a part of mm -hmm. it. You have to be able to pick yourself up and get back to the grind. And mm -hmm. that's why I hate participation trophies. It's okay to lose. Okay. Sure. But how do you handle losing? Do you like, Oh my God, am I, I'm supposed to be a winner. I'm, I was trained all my life that third place and fifth place was okay. Mm -hmm. But you find out in the real world, third place when you're up for that job, you know, ain't, ain't going to cut it, you know? So I think losing at an early age develops a certain type of character because it makes you and it forces you to look at yourself in the mirror. I don't care if you're eight-year-old, 15-year-old, or, 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 or a 20-year-old. I'll tell you a quick story. Steph Curry was telling the story about his father. You know, Steph Curry was nine years old. He missed the game-winning shot. Their team lost. He comes back to the house and his mom, like a mom, you know, very loving, Oh, it's okay. It's okay, son. You'll be okay. Don't worry about it. And Steph was a little upset. And the one thing, Del Curry, his father, who played in the NBA, he looked at his son, uh, Steph, and he said, doesn't feel too good, does it? And, and the mom was like, don't, don't be so hard on him. I'm not being hard on him. He goes, so what are you going to do about it? The next time you're in that situation, what are you going to do about it? So Steph, at nine years old, goes to the, to, to the yard and starts putting up shots, putting up shots. He was, at an early age, was instilled in, okay, if you fail, okay, you miss a shot, get back on the horse. Find a way to get better and better. That's training, okay? Again, there's nothing wrong with losing. There's nothing wrong with failing. But how are you going to react to that failure? And Del Curry instilled that his, instilled in his son of, okay, you miss a shot, let's go work on it. Continue to get better. And that's how you train your son or young athletes. Sure, yeah, it builds character for them later. Um, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. And uh, there's talk about possibly baseball starting up in Arizona using the uh, the uh, um, spring training field and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, first of all, I hope that happens. Yeah. You know, I think fans <laughs> – want to see sports, any type of sports right now, any live events, even if fans are not in the stadiums. Uh, I, I think it's important once, once it's safe. Now, again, sure. this is all uh, inducive of meaning the United States government, the health official says they give Major League Baseball okay. So once they give the okay, I think it's important to have baseball back uh, and all sports back. And baseball more than football, uh, more than uh, the NBA, you can social distance. You know, there's social distancing on the field. You have a center fielder, right field, left fielder. You're constantly social distancing on that field. So you can play play the sport. It's happening in Korea right now. And, well, somebody asked, well, what about the dugout? Well, they have plans in place where if that were to happen in Arizona, they're going to build these uh, big canopies where you can have a huge dugout using the stands, you know, or the dugout. And if a player, let's say a pitcher is not, uh, going to be pitching. Let's say if Clayton Kershaw is not starting that night, he doesn't have to come or stay for the game. He can go back home 
or stay in the, in the clubhouse. So there's plenty of things you can do to social distance. And uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, a, a positive thing when baseball comes back. Yeah, give us one more thing to do at least while we're all quarantined in our houses. Yeah, yeah. it would be nice. Um, what kind of impact do you feel, if any, that sports in general might see from having to take this break? Now, I know football is not really in the topic just yet because it's later on, but yeah. do you see if, if NBA does – come back and they start up the season again or they start into the playoffs and baseball do you see there being an impact maybe with attendance once once everything's let's say we get the all clear everybody can start going out they can go sporting events do you see them taking a hit at all and again this is just personal opinion there's well, no there's no right or wrong answer but. i think first of all obviously sports are going to take it everything's going to take a hit sure. let's let's be honest everything sure. has changed um so I don't think it's, you know, everything will be back to normal, so to speak, for maybe 16, 18, maybe a couple of years. You know, uh, when I said 16, 18 months, maybe a couple of years. Uh, I hope it gets back sooner rather than later. But again, you know, we've had to put a huge pause on life. Uh, and a lot of people are going to be affected by this. And as entertainers, as sports people, you understand that maybe you can give uh, the people something to, uh, to hope for a glimmer of hope, whether that light at the end of the tunnel, to see baseball on your televisions again, maybe you get some sense of normalcy again. At least you can feel, hey, we're on our way back. And I think that's important. But uh, make no mistake about it. Everybody's going to be hurting uh, from this. Uh, and, you know, hopefully we, we'll get this behind us sooner rather than later. And, you know, we hate to talk about sports, um, it, meaning, oh, it's, it's the end all be all. We know it's not, but we all know how, you know, especially the last month, we know how big sports are, mm -hmm. you know, it's a sense of relief. It's a, a sense of hope for fans. Uh, and, and when you work nine to five, sometimes you have these the, the men and women working seven in the morning to eight o'clock at night grinding. They want to be able to come home and relax and watch a baseball game to kind of uh, uh, to wind down every night and people need that i was just talking to a couple nba guys you know they, they love baseball they, they admit they don't watch every day but they they love the playoffs and they said man I, I will never take baseball i will never take basketball i won't take any sport for granted anymore yeah. and i think that's where we're at as a society we're not going to take sports for granted anymore <laughs> yeah definitely now do you speaking of nba do you do you see them coming back and how hard is that to take that kind of a break to have played the whole season practically take a break like that and then have to come full bore into a, a playoff situation. Yeah. And that's the decision they're going to have to make. Do they have yeah. a, a, like a, a camp or there's type of spring training. Uh, I think they're going to have to do that at least for yeah. a couple of weeks and, and then start their season. It, it depends when they come back. If, if they're back June 1st, maybe they can play 12, uh, 14 regular season games and then start the playoffs or do they come back? Because again, Basketball, basketball, unlike baseball, it's a contact sport. You know, you have LeBron James and Kawhi Leonard battling it out. These guys are bumping each other constantly on offense and defense, and they're sweating on each other. So that is a completely different sport than, let's say, baseball. So uh, I think that would be a sport that they really have to make sure everything is in the clear. Uh, but once they get back, whether it's June 1st, July 1st, or August 1st, I think everybody's going uh, to welcome it. Yeah, definitely. Um, another quick shift, a little uh, um, different type of feel now. Um, 16 seasons, right? Hopefully I'm right with that, 16 seasons. A World Series, is there one thing that stands out to you the most over those 16 seasons, aside from the World Series? That like one memorable moment? Well, I mean... There's probably you too know, many to list, right? There, 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 there's so many memorable ones. I, the thing that sticks out to me is I had great teammates. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was very fortunate. Um, you know, started off my career at Baltimore. Cal Ripken Jr. was a guy that I admired growing up, and he was even better than advertised as a teammate. Uh, a guy that always was there to help, uh, gave me a lot of advice. I, I, he, he was one of the, my favorite teammates. David he was a great teammate of mine that I loved. Brady Anderson, um, Albert Bell. I still talk to Albert uh, to this day. He lives down the street from me. Uh, he was an intense competitor. I wish he would have stayed healthy. 
because uh, uh, he he was on that trajectory as a Hall of Famer. Sure. And then on to the Cubs, you know, I traded for Sammy Sosa, I played with Derek Lee, Juan Pierre, so many great teammates. Uh, Sammy Sosa I ended up playing with uh, in Texas. I love playing with him, Michael Young. And then, you know, I've got a chance to play with my, my brother, Scott. We both represented uh, Team Mexico in the World Baseball Classic in, in 2009. Uh, that was a blast. Uh, and then get a chance to win, with the, win a World Series with the New York Yankees, a team that was filled with superstars, but everybody got along and everybody knew that they weren't bigger than the team. You know, Alex mm -hmm. Rodriguez was a great teammate. Derek Jeter was the captain of the team. Mariano Rivera, a, a great leader. Uh, Johnny Damon, and so on and so forth. We had a team, and I really learned how to win. And, know, and knowing that it doesn't matter if you're a superstar or the 25th man on the, on the team, in order for you, for us to win a championship, everybody has to be together, you know, and we were uh, uh, a unique team full of characters, but we played for each other. And it was surely a tremendous uh, uh, feeling when we were playing left field. When we uh, closed out the championship, I ran from the left field in into the pile. And it was just a culmination of not just my career, but my grandfather's career, my brother Scott's career, and my dad's career. We, you know, they, they never had a chance to, to win a championship, to win a World Series. And I was very fortunate to, to do that. So the championship was not only for me, but it was for my family as well. Sure, it means that much more. And I've, I've heard people say, I, I saw an interview with A-Rod, and he had mentioned, you built camaraderie with all the teammates and all the teams you play for. But there's a different level of camaraderie when you're at that level and you win together in a championship. Is that, yeah. is that something you experienced yourself as well? Is a different level. And that is accurate. I mean, I'll, I used to run into Alex uh, in L.A. when he, he'd he cover the postseason and the Dodgers would be in the postseason. As soon as you see each other, we, we'd smile because we won a championship together, you know. And, you know, I, I run into Derek when the Marlins come in. I go see, go sit in the suite. We talk and we just start smiling, laughing because we knew we won a championship together. Yeah. There's something special about getting to the mountaintop of your respective profession. And to be able to do it with the Yankees in Major League Baseball to win a World Series, it, it, it's special. So I, I get invited to uh, their uh, old-timers game uh, every year. Uh, and, and it's special seeing those guys. So uh, it's a unique experience. And, and to do it in New York with the Yankees, something I'll never forget. We're going to call it the Legends game, not the old-timers. Of course, game. Legends. You're not old enough yet. <laughs> um, I may or may not have spoken to somebody that you know. Speak, talk, speaking on memorable times, there was a season that you had been beamed more than, uh, more than normal. It was about 12 times that season. Mm -hmm. I believe you were on deck. Bartolo was pitching. It was 2003. I remember. Scott Erickson hit somebody, and somebody asked well, who, you. Who, who told you this? Does, it, does this ring a bell at all? Oh, we're at Kibiski Park. I, I, I remember where, exactly where we're at. Who told you the story? <laughs> Go, well, I heard this teammate may have given you a little motivation to unwillingly charge the mound. But that well, that teammate was, was, was Gary Matthews Jr., who was you really – You mailed I had, it. I, I had a couple teammates. So, yeah, well, I'll tell you the story. So, Scott Erickson may have started that game. Uh, and I was leading the league. And I was having a, a, my best season up to date. My career, I really thought I had a chance to, to, to make an all-star team. Uh, I was, this is right before I got hurt. But I remember we're in the in ninth inning. The White Sox are giving it to us. We're losing maybe, you know, 8-1 to one or 7-1. to one. Bartolo Colon's throwing 100 miles an hour. Everybody sees Bartolo Colon now as big, sexy, throwing 89, <laughs> 91 with a sinker. Yeah. Back then in 2003, he was throwing 100. Okay, easy 100 miles an hour. So he dealt that night. He gets out of the game, you know, comes out, excuse me, comes out the eighth inning. You know, after the eighth inning, and he's done. You got two guys warming up in the bullpen. So he's done for the night. Jorge Julio, young kid, throws 100 miles an hour, comes in, just rookie kid, scared to death. You know, he's a rookie. He's facing his hero, Magdalene Ordonez, okay? Uh, he's facing his hero. He's, he's afraid of him because that's his hero. He hits Magdalene Ordonez in the head, uh, unintentionally, of course, okay? Sure. He's scared. Nerve. So Mags is fine. He gets to second base. I'm playing second base. I go, Max, you all right? Goes, yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. You, you know he didn't need Oh, no, I know this kid's a good kid. I know he didn't try to hit me. I see at the corner of my eye, I see coming up the tunnel, 
because in the White Sox Community Park, their tunnels in the middle of their dugout. Okay. Okay. He telling, um, I think Ozzy Gein was the coach at the time, telling Ozzy, hey, I'm going back. I'm going back out there. Well, it just so happens I'm leading off that, that next inning. I'm leading off the inning, so I know I'm going get, to get hit, right? Now, I'm leading the league, probably Major League Baseball, getting hit in the first two months of the season. And, and, they, and the White Sox already hit me like four times in like six games already, you know? So I've come in the dugout, and I'm kind of ticked. If they hit me, I'm, I'm going to do something. So Gary Matthews Jr., he knows exactly what's on my mind. He goes, Jay Hare, if they hit you, I'll be the first one out there. I'll be the first one out there. And, and Jeff, Jeff Conine, who's a great teammate, also said, Jay Hare, I'll, I'll be there too, brother. Don't, don't you worry. So Bartone is a big guy. Big guy. Boxing skills. You know, I got, I got some boxing skills. But again, I'm at this time about 185 pounds, you know, and Bartone is about a two, 280. And anything can happen abroad. Long story short, first pitch nearly hits me he misses so i tell uh miguel olivo hey bro because he's the catcher bro you guys had your chance you missed you had your chance you missed right miguel olivo looks at me doesn't say another word all right here it comes squares me up 100 miles an hour go are you kidding me are you kidding (laughs) me right benches immediately because we all know something's happening so i'm sitting there uh Looking at Bartolo, he's like, what you going to do? Now we're going to charge. So I start kind of walking. And then M- M- Mickey gets in front of me. I'm starting to bark at him. Bro, you guys hit me four times already. This kid didn't try to hit Max. Bro, we start barking. Finally, Jeff Conan gets next to me. And Conan is right there. And I told him, Niner, Niner, grab me. Grab me. As soon as he, he grabbed, grabbed me, I go off. I start challenging Fred <laughs> Thomas to a fight. I start challenging the whole White Sox to a fight because – Conan has got me locked up. And Frank Thomas looked at me because he's known me since I was 12 years old. He goes, this guy's crazy. He's crazy, right? So I'm going. And then Armando Rios. Armando Rios. We became teammates later, okay? He goes, I'll fight you. I'll fight you right here, right? So everybody <coughs> calmed down after that. You know, after, you know, benches cleared. I remember the next, uh, at that, at that, um, after that game, we turn on Sports Center. I, I'm leading sports center. I'm sitting there pointing, whatever, yelling, trying to start a brawl, and Conite's, like, grabbing me. So it was <laughs> definitely a, a, a wild night. But I had to put those guys that notice that, hey, you just can't punk me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had to stand up for yourself. Now, do you think that's part of – do you think that was the beginning of your acting prowess? Uh, let's, not, let's not kid ourselves. I was acting like a big leaguer my whole career. <laughs> so for me to play 16 season, I must have acted uh, pretty good. I acted like a big leaguer that I belonged. Uh, so well, I think I fooled a lot of people. Nah, you're gonna last it that long just acting. <laughs> you're not that good of an actor. <laughs> um, oh, is that an insult? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I I I may have asked Gary to give me a a little tidbit of something I can throw at you. So that's what he gave me. Um, the last thing, the one I really wanted to get to. You got some. You got a project you're working on right now that you're getting yeah. ready to launch podcast yes um caught looking that thing you can tell us about it yes yeah, caught looking uh it'll be on uh, itunes spotify uh, on seven different platforms uh it'll launch probably uh in about a week to 10 days i'll announce it on my instagram and, and twitter it's something that you know i've kind of wanted to do the last uh, couple of years but now that we have a lot of time on our hands i decided to, to <laughs> yeah. get into it i have really good guests already uh locked in um, mm-hmm. I'll tell you a couple of my guests, Phil Handy is an assistant coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. I interviewed him. He's worked with Kawhi Leonard. He's worked with Kobe Bryant, uh, LeBron James. He's, you know, he was with him in, in, with the Cavaliers in, in 2016 and with the Lakers this year, uh, has really helped so many great, great players. He's a guest uh, on, on my podcast, Sage Steele. She covers the NBA. Uh, she actually covers the NBA finals as well. Uh, I've been a friends of her for, for years. We go back all the way to my Baltimore days. She's one of the best in the business. Uh, Tony Gwynn Jr., who we all know Tony as a baseball player, dad, Hall of Famer, uh, Todd Frazier, and so on and so forth. I've got a, a great group of guys. It's not just baseball. I'm going to delve, delve into basketball, uh, football, acting, uh, the business world as well, just the culture. So it's not just it's not a baseball or, or not only a sports show. It's a, a show for everybody. And we're going to try to entertain and be insightful as well. 
Uh, and the one thing too, I don't want to be too long. It's not going to be a 45 minute podcast or 30 minutes. It's going to be about 10, 15 minutes that way. Cause we all have, you know, short attention spans, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it'll be, it'll be insightful and it'll be fun and entertaining. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. looks like we got one question here. I don't know what it is. So we're going to open it and see, we're going to roll the dice. If you're up for it, let's see what it is. What? You hit the right button here. Okay, this is kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. What about everyone touching the same ball, though? That's a risk, right? For Mr. Too Good. That, that's a great question. The one thing is that I've learned from health officials is not so much touching of, of the ball. is after you touch your face, you don't go to your mouth, you don't go to your nose, or you don't go to your eyes. That's the biggest thing. And that goes for not just baseball players. It goes for if you're at the grocery store, if you're mm -hmm. uh, out and about, uh, and if somebody has this disease and if you're touching something, because we're obviously going to be touching, even if you have gloves, if you're touching something with your gloves and you go to your mouth, you go to your nose, or do you go to your eyes, then there's, there's mm -hmm. a possibility of uh, transferring uh, that disease. So as long as you don't go to your mouth or go to your face, then you should be okay. But in the dugout, you have plenty of, of, of uh, ways to wash your hands. Sure, sure. Good okay. question. That's I a really good question. Yeah, well, that was Mr. Too Good asked that question. It was a good question. Um, okay. I think that's all I got. I think I've taken enough of your time. All right. A lot of good information. I, I appreciate you sharing. Uh, just a reminder, keep an eye out for the podcast, right? Caught looking. Maybe a week or two. That's right. And uh, in About a week to seven, a week to 10 days. Okay. We'll keep an eye all out right. for it. Otherwise, that's it. Thank you for joining me. Thank everybody for coming on and no Thank problem. you for matching with me today. I feel well, we've got to look good, right? <laughs> That's right.